second here. Shit. Oh, it's really hard. Okay, wait. I need you to the side of me so the light hits him. Yeah, there you go. Uh, one second. Sorry, it's tricky lens. Okay. Let me look a little, look down at my hand down here. Yeah, there we go. Boom. Thank you. Oh, God, there wasn't film in the camera. There wasn't film in the camera. Yeah, you, you have to go? Yeah, yeah. Ah! There wasn't film in the camera. Oh, that was, that was a good one, too. It does happen. That's good for an educational video. That clip is from Alex Sos Magnum course. It's still the only course that I've ever purchased before, and I highly recommend it. It's $100. Um, definitely pick it up if you are even remotely a fan of Alex Soth. But I love that clip so much because on the internet, on social media, it's very hard to come by someone of that level, someone that sells $20,000 prints. And the fact that he can show mistakes like that is just crazy to me because everyone wants to be seen as perfect, someone that doesn't make mistakes so they can sell prints, so they can sell courses, so you can subscribe to the YouTube channel because they have all the answers to everything. And I think that inspires me so much because like that dude is at the top of his game. He has a YouTube channel where he just talks about obscure uh, unpopular photo books and tells he tells you why they're great and that's one of the reasons why he inspires me so much and I could sit here and talk for hours about who inspires me or what inspires me but I just wanted to narrow it down to some people that inspired me this year and there's always going to be the Brian Scoopmonts, um, the Mark Mahaney like I mentioned in the last video and uh, Aaron Springer who is also a photographer and those are probably the top three photographers that inspire me at the moment because they do personal projects and they do editorial and commission work. And I want to kind of push myself into that type of work. And I just really love what they're doing. So they will be listed down below as well. But I wanted to mention some new people in this video. And I think Soth is a good spot to start off. Yeah, so this is a picture I was really excited about. I missed it slightly because of this focal plane issue. You know, it's a funny thing because I, here we have a digital picture, perfectly sharp. Um, but not in, not so interested, uh, even though it's really sharp. I mean, what I do, part of the thing I'm interested in is this quality of space and is the lack of focus in the background and the shallow depth of field and uh and it's not it's not bad but so i sort of missed it you know i missed it here um yeah it's a bummer i mean photography is is all about near misses um i mean the thing that i always talk about and i'm not I'm not happy with this picture because of that, but, and I always talk with students about Migrant Mother because if you look at this picture, you know, the most famous photograph of all time, the focus is right here. The focus is on the shoulders and on this hair and the eyes are wildly out of focus still became you know the greatest picture of all and time. again in that clip and, he's and showing you that he took the photo he's telling you why he took the photo he wanted it to be the the lack of depth of field eight by ten gives you that look and just the fact that he can admit that he missed it admit that the digital photo is perfect but there's something about the film that just really speaks to me because as you guys know I mess up a lot taking photos, I miss focus. And when you're doing it yourself and when you're kinda in that whole process, you're thinking to yourself that the greats of photography, there's no way they make these mistakes. They get a perfect exposure every time and that's just simply not the case. And to see someone of his level 
showing you that he can miss focus. He can have a soft photo. It just really speaks to me. And it's something that inspires me to just keep going. All, making work is always a, a kind of, it's always a kind of struggle. It's not often very fluid. Sometimes it is. Once you figure out a certain rhythm of working that pertains to a particular place, or once you've met somebody who has keys to all the doors, you know, but that takes a long time. There's so many, so many dead ends and, and wrong turns and um, failures involved in the process of, of making something. It always, it always feels, I'm sort of copying, I think Robert Adams or something, but it always feels miraculous, you know, when something works out because it doesn't feel like it ever will. When you're, when you're in the trenches, you know, and, and you're making your work, it doesn't ever feel like you're going to arrive at that place where something does work out. But I think part of the deal is that you just have to, to wait, you know, you have to have a kind of blind faith that what you're doing is right that you're following this kind of state of intuition that's only about guessing and that there aren't any wrong answers. So just having a kind of trust and faith in that is essential. But yeah, there's, there's countless, countless wrong turns and dead ends and along the way. I wanted to mention Kern Hadelberg because like he said, you never know when things are going to pop up. You never know when you're going to get that photo that you really love. And the other day, I drove around for two hours. And in my head, I was like, this is a complete waste of time. I was having anxiety about everything. I didn't want to get out and take photographs. I didn't want to knock on doors. And at the time, I was like, I'm just wasting my time. I'm wasting gas. I'm wasting energy. And nothing is going to come out of this. And I went home without taking any pictures. And in the grand scheme of things, that's just all part of the process. It's part of whatever project you're working on. It's part of being a photographer. You're, ne you're not going to go out every time and take a thousand bangers or a hundred different amazing good quality photos. Some days you're not going to take anything. Some days you're going to take two or three good pictures that you might like. But um, yeah, I drove around for two hours, didn't take a single photo. And then the next day, I was actually driving out to uh, Carlisle, Illinois, and I just kind of put all that behind me and just focused on making pictures, and that's exactly what I did. And when you come home from the day of making some pictures and taking some photographs, that's what makes you feel good about the whole process, but you need to take in the bad stuff as well especially when you don't take photos because that's part of the process as well. So don't look at it as a bad thing. Look at it as you went out there. It didn't work out, but you learned something in the process and you're just going to go out the next day and do it again. I, I'm very ambivalent. I want you to know and care about the people I photograph or think about them. And I make it as clear as possible. And at the same time, it, it, I, I, I'm not an advertisement. I'm not, I don't want to own your mind. I want you to, you will hopefully bring yourself to the picture. And I don't consider it me anyway. They're not my pictures. They're pictures that really work that I had a hand in making. They're not my pictures. They're pictures of those people. That's, I don't know how crazy that is. I actually believe they're of those people. Which is completely not true. Those people are far more complex than anything that I showed you. It's just one little second of their life. And they went on and are doing something else. They're living their dead, I don't know. I mean, it was crazy for me to be at the Vietnam Memorial. I needed to be there for me, for my understanding of how to deal with pain and suffering. But looking back, I think it was very inappropriate for me to be at this memorial. I wondered why aren't there other people taking pictures here? Well they were. They were taking pictures with long telephoto lenses, probably of something awful like a teddy bear and a rose at the bottom of the memorial. So the pictures I took don't even show the memorial. And I felt enormously guilty. Am I here torturing people for no good reason? 
I wanted to mention Judith Joy Ross because obviously her 8x10 portraits are wonderful and they're just amazing to look at. It just has this ethereal quality to it that I just can't pinpoint with other portraits that I see. It's kind of like a Brian Scootmont thing. Um, but her talk about the Vietnam Memorial, she was talking about how other photographers were out just outside the memorial taking pictures of names and headstones and flowers and things like that. And she just went into the memorial and started taking portraits. And it kind of made me realize that when I come across a scene, the most obvious thing to photograph might not be the best in terms of story or in terms of uh, exposition or composition, stuff like that. So it really inspired me to just look at the scene overall and not just go for right away for the thing that sticks out the most and try to look at it in a more obscure way. So what you have to understand, and I'm sure you know, and I'm sure all of the listeners are well aware of that, you know, hospital lighting is, <laughs> it's the most clinical lighting possible. It's really flat and just really quite horrible. Um, but necessary for, for the work, right? But, you know, I already use, I already interject just like, I interject a bit of light into the pictures that I make in general. But for this, it was, it was really important to do so because the, the, for starters, again, I, we, I have to, I have to say like, we weren't able to photograph any patients, nor were we able to photograph any of the healthcare workers who had not agreed to be photographed. So our options were really limited. And so if anybody was in the background by some chance, we couldn't use the photograph at all. And so it was almost necessary for me to then isolate the subjects that we had outlined in the, at, the, at the beginning of the shoot using, using certain ways of uh, crafting and, and shaping light. I ended up buying Philip Montgomery's book, American Mirror, and I bought it because obviously I wanted to support him and the work that he's doing, but I bought it because I wanted to be inspired and have something physical to remind me of that because the way that he uses light, I am a natural light photographer. I hardly ever use artificial light, mostly because I don't know how and mostly because I'm afraid of it. But the way that he makes these dramatic scenes and these dramatic portraits with artificial light is crazy, and I've never really seen it before, mostly because the photographers that I look at just use natural light. And the more that I look into Philip's work and Mark Mahaney's work, it just goes to show that you can use it to a very real and dramatic effect to make your photos better. And it really inspires me to learn more and experiment more with artificial light, uh, reflectors, bouncing light, things like that. I just want to get more involved in that because there are going to be times where the sun's down, it's behind a cloud, um, and you're going to have to use something else to get the picture that you want. And uh, he definitely inspires me to do that. I wanted to mention Carl Ramberg as well because... People need to know that you can get inspiration anywhere and it doesn't have to be someone that's super popular. It doesn't have to be someone that has a book or sells $10,000 prints. It can be someone that has a gallery in a college in their hometown. And I met up with Carl a couple months back for the 8x10 video that I did where I took a portrait of him and missed focus. And he took a portrait of me and did not miss focus. But I met him... And we've been talking a lot on the Discord server that I'm in. And he's just a really uh, informative and educational photographer, which I really like because he makes me want to dive deeper into photo books and the history of photography and getting more educated on things like that. But like I said, he made a short, uh, small little gallery in his hometown of Kirksville at his university. And he did a whole walkthrough of it. And it was just really nice to see someone that you know and someone that you met through photography have something like that where their pictures are on, the, on, the, on a wall, where they're uh, selling work to people and they're just putting their work out there for people to see when it's not on social media. So uh, if you're not following along with him, definitely do so. I think he's going to make a lot of good pictures from here on out.
The last photographer that I want to mention for this is a girl by the name of Deanna Dykeman, and she made a project by the name of Leaving and Waving. I've seen it countless places, and I didn't really know what it was until I looked into it. And in, in her own words, she says, For 27 years, I took photographs as I waved goodbye and drove away from visiting my parents at their home in Iowa. I started in 1991 with a quick snapshot, and I continued taking photographs with each departure. I never set out to make this a series. I just took these photographs as a way to deal with the sadness of leaving. It gradually turned into our goodbye ritual. These photographs are part of a larger body of work. And it seemed natural to keep the camera busy because I had been taking pictures every day while I was there. In 2009, there is a photograph where my father is no longer there. He passed away a few days after his 91st birthday. My mother continued to wave goodbye to me. Her face, become, her face became more forlorn with my departures. In 2017, my mother had to move to assisted living. For a few months, I photographed the goodbyes from her apartment door. In October of 2017, she passed away. When I left after her funeral, I took one more photograph of the empty driveway. For the first time in my life, no one was waving back to me. And I read that, and I'm kind of getting emotional right now talking about it because it's just really a great project to do. And I know we can all get wrapped up in taking the perfect photo, and if you're in large format, setting everything up and making sure exposures are correct and not missing a beat with anything. But this kind of drives home the idea to me that um, when looking back at someone, when talking about someone that is no longer with you, you're not going to be looking for the perfect photo. You're not going to be looking for the perfect portrait with the best lighting. You're just going to be looking for anything that uh, lets you remember them. And um, that's just something that I want to take in to next year because there have been times where I've been wanting to take a photo, but I'm just like, the lighting's not good. Like, I don't have the right film for this. And it's like, I could have just taken the picture on my phone or I could have just used the di digital camera that I'm using right now. So I want to be better about that going into next year. And if there's something that I want to capture, um, I'm just going to take the picture and I don't need to think about it too much. It just, if I'm feeling inclined to take a photo, I'm just going to take it. And this project and this whole thing uh, really hit home for me as you can tell but so anyway uh, that's who inspired me this year there are many more out there but I didn't want to make this video an hour long of me just rambling about other people's work because I've said this before I am not very uh, great at expressing my thoughts on photography I'm not very educated in that department I can't talk about the history of photography I can't talk about the, the educational stuff. Um, I just know what I like. I just know what inspires me to get out and shoot. And I know what doesn't inspire me. And most of it, 99% of it, is on Twitter. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, I'm on Patreon if you want to support the channel. I did just post a video of making some new work on there and just converting it, editing it, talking about composition and some metering uh, that I did. So if you want to check that out, it's down below. And if you don't, no big deal. Just keep watching the videos and doing what you've been doing because it helps me out a lot. So with that said, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy New Year. Um, and yeah, look forward to seeing you guys in 2022. Peace.